Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio, broadcast from the Philadelphia offices of Morgan Lewis, the law firm. And uh, we have a great lineup of guests for you on our show today. Jeffrey, will you please give us a rundown? Sure, Herb. And I'd first like to thank Morgan Lewis for hosting our show today. We have Marianne Frey, CEO of Maternity Care Coalition. Fred Fox, the CEO of a company called Planalytics. Adam Stokar is the founder and president of Club OS. And Chris Chapman is the founder, SVP of Engineering of Amino Payments. Excellent. I'd like to thank my co-hosts, Jeff Mack, Newmark Knight Frank, Phil Haregi, Saber Systems, Brian Wallace, GoTo, Peter Snelling, Merrill Lynch, Andrew Hanlon, Hanlon Creative, and Meg Maloney. Addison Group for giving me hand structuring the questions. And let's get to our first guest, Marianne Frey, CEO of Maternity Care Coalition. Marianne, what is the Maternity Care Coalition? With a staff of over 150 and an amazing board, we are an organization that supports 1,500 families annually, pregnant women and children zero to three. How do you support them? What do you do for them? We do home visiting. We have advocates that go into their home and support prenatal education. We provide all kinds of services um, before, during, and after pregnancy and up to three, getting them ready for school. Wow. Okay. Drew. Marion, can you uh, describe to our listening audience the neighborhood you grew up in? It was an urban setting in North Philadelphia back in the 60s, and in that area was... Um, pretty much with projects around it, yeah, urban area, urban setting. And, and you had a rather diverse educational upbringing. Um, can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, I went from um, the urban setting that I just described to the main line, um, and that's outside of Philadelphia, um, with a stop in Kensington, which is an area in Philadelphia. Uh, now it has a big problem. So, with so you grew up in an urban area, primarily a black community? Correct, and, and Latina. And then you moved to, then you went to school in primarily a uh, <clears throat> urban white environment back in the 60s. So it wasn't that diverse, huh? Uh, no. And then you uh, went to school at a private boarding school <clears throat> where the privileged kids would go. I guess there weren't too many black kids there at that time. Uh, there were six. Oh. <laughs> how many students were in the whole school? Thousands. Um, well, we weren't thousands, but there were hundreds, yeah. Oh, excuse me. All right. And uh, who's got the next question? Marianne, uh, living where you were living, what were your mom and dad doing for a living? Uh, my parents were missionaries to the U.S. from Jamaica, and uh, we were they were running a mission, mm-hmm. rescue mission. And did you work in that mission as a kid? Yes, every single day. Uh, what did you learn from your father, the missionary, that uh, had an impact on you? Um, discipline. What do you What do you mean? What did he te- What did he teach you? How, how did he well, teach you? Well, when you discipline? get up every morning at six thirty and read the Bible, and you have to cook and clean and prepare, um, it's discipline. Wait, 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 wait. You got up at six thirty and you were reading the Bible every morning. Every morning, Monday through Sunday. How How'd you feel about that? Uh, I didn't uh-huh. love it. Uh huh. What's the positive effect of that on you nowadays? I actually get up and read my Bible every day today. Why? Um, well, faith is important to me. What do you mean? I've I've come back. I guess you. Uh, Why is faith important? What, what do you talk? How's that coming to your work every day? Because if you can believe it, you can dream it. You can make it happen. Hmm. Peter, Marianne, what was it like working in the mission? What did you see? How did it affect you? I saw people that I actually um, went to school with. In fact, uh, there was a gentleman that I was handing a sandwich to, and he said, Marianne. And I realized that it was a gentleman that I went to seventh grade with. And I think at that time I was back in Wait, 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 wait a second. So you're telling me that some of the kids you went to school with were in the mission that you were working in. Yeah. That your father, that was, you were living above this mission. Mm-hmm. How'd that, how'd that affect you? What, what's that mean? It was what's devastating. I, I couldn't believe that he looked the way he did. He was out on the streets. I think he had probably gotten to drugs or something. So kids that you went to school with were actually being served by the mission. Mm-hmm. And you and how did that make you feel? What did that do to you? It made me feel like there before the grace of God go I. What's that mean? It just means that it's not very much difference between um, having something and maybe not having what you think you have. What do you mean by that? That he had every opportunity that I thought I had, but he ended up on the streets. What's that have to do with what you're doing nowadays? Because people need, they need help. And what we're doing now is we're helping people that often are marginalized. Mm, who's got the next question? Speaking of um, having a lot or not having a lot, you told us a little about a friend from Shipley, Cynthia. Can you tell us a little about her and what she meant to you? 
Yeah, she's um, she meant a lot to me. She actually um, stood by me when her father said that I couldn't come into her his home because I was black. But she's been always there for me in my wedding, um, helped me move out. And when you go to work every day, what do you think about that she would be telling you? Um, you're worthy. What, what do you, give me that again. You're worthy. I mean, when we, at Shipley, there were a lot of people that um, said things, behaved in a way that didn't make you feel that way. But Pe- she always did. Peter? Marianne, there was also a teacher in seventh grade, Mrs. Barlow, that had an influence. Tell us. Yeah, she, she felt that I had a lot of talent and she believed in me and she encouraged me to pursue writing, particularly at that time. Mm-hmm. Marianne, how, how important is mission in what you do or having a per- sense of mission? It's everything. I think if you if people believe that someone believes in them, they can do anything. As a follow-up, uh, growing up in the 60s and having the background you had, how much did the civil rights movement at the time influence you? It influenced me a lot, actually. Um, I think I really admired Angela Davis. It's probably where my rebellious nature came from. And um, I, it, 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 you felt a sense of identity that was in purpose. So I think the civil rights movement Meg. was important. Mary, and you mentioned a rebellious nature. Is that um, a youngest child trait? Um, it could be. How uh, many siblings do you have? Five. Five, I'm youngest six. of five. Yeah, I'm, the, how, yeah, I'm sixth. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. So how do you consider yourself to be different than they are? Um, I think we're all kind of very service-oriented, and I, I think I'm just a little more social than they are. Brian? Did you feel any pressure being a child of missionaries? Yes, uh, because actually my parents had accents, um, and so I, the black Americans felt that I didn't fit in with them. The whites didn't think I fit in with them, so it was a pressure of just feeling isolated because I was different. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Give me this again. So your your parents were, because they were from Jamaica, mm-hmm. and you're black, you didn't fit in with the Give me that again. Well, Jamaica was colonized by the British, so there was, uh, there was a sense of, there was a difference. It was, you know, we spoke the Queen's English, even though my parents had an accent, and that was different from Ebonics, if you will. So there was always a sense of the different language. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, the, you, basically, you kept on putting your... You, you grew up in environments, educational, which I was aware of, and now I'm finding out just because of who you are, where you were different consistently. Yes. H- how's that different? How's that feeling different? How's that aiding what you're doing nowadays in your career as the CEO of the Maternity Care Coalition? You know, we serve a lot of women that are um, in vulnerable communities and marginalized, and I, I understand how they feel. And it, it helps me to relate to them in a way that I think makes them feel like there's hope. Marianne, you deal with a lot of young mothers and, and very young children. Mm-hmm. We were talking in the green room. You have three children of your own. Yes, I do. What are their names? Sebastian, Samuel, and Spencer. And what have you learned from your kids? Uh, hum- humility, that you cannot control anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Next question. Mary, who's got do it? you get a chance to tell the women you deal with that you believe in them? Uh, every day. Every day. How does that make you feel? Um, it, meaningful, rewarded, and, and make... We've got to help each other. There's no way, just like um, Tagline, if everybody is not cared for, then it doesn't matter what you have. And how does it make them feel? Validated. Um, When I took over this organization two two months ago from another leader, the overwhelming thought was we really feel like we can relate to you and we really appreciate that you look like us and you have a similar background. So, so this connection that Peter is pointing out, that, that's really important to building an organization. I thought a CEO was hiring and firing people and raising money, but it doesn't sound to me from what, what Peter asked you. That's really the essence of what you do. Yeah, the essence of what we do is we develop people. We develop um, because when people are feeling as though they have um, a place and they they're valued, whatever your product or service, it doesn't matter, you'll be able to achieve success because – people believe what they're doing how do you share that feeling of potential that's what you're talking about how Mm -hmm. do you share that through one-on-ones um through just being very um, entrepreneurial and and, and empowering so people that come to work they may think that they're coming in to do one thing but what they're doing is they're changing lives is it possible that your life is an example absolutely do the people at work know who you are pardon me do the people at work know who you are I think after this interview, they will. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the best part of your day? 
um, walking into the door and saying hello to the person at the front desk, um, hugging every person before we have a meeting. It may be odd, but that's my style. Why do you do that? Connection. Mm-hmm. I want people to feel connected. What's the website address of the Maternity Care Coalition? MaternityCareCoalition.org. We've been speaking with Marianne Frey, CEO of the Maternity Care Coalition here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment right after this break. And your name and organization is? My name is Mike Massiello. I'm the founder and CEO of Diversified Staffing. And what does Diversified Staffing do? What we do is we we help our customers find talent in the areas of information technology, finance, and human resources. All right. How young were you when this recruiting began to show up in your blood? I was six years old. Doing what? At the time, I I had realized that you could make money returning bottles and cans. So I started enlisting some of my friends and buddies and buying their bottles and cans for five cents from them, getting them to give them to me, and then taking them to the redemption for 10 cents each. All right, so you, how old were you now? You're six, seven six, years, seven six years, years old. old, and you're getting your buddies to give you their empties, Their moms and dads' bottles and cans. And then you went ahead and you and I resold them. So you really, this recruiting thing really is in your, how about the, what happened in 11 or 12 with the newspaper stuff? Yeah, so it, when we were younger, there were two big newspaper routes in town. And what I wanted to do was consult. Yeah. What's the website address of this organization? It's dsgstaff.com. Let me have that one more time. dsgstaff.com. And your name again is? Mike Massiello. And this has been your Business Spotlight. We're back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Fred Fox. Fred is the CEO of a company known as Planalytics. Fred, what is Planalytics? What do you guys do? Planalytics is a service that uh, measures and manages the impact of weather on all types of retailers and manufacturers through through a cloud-based analytics. So you help businesses understand how to produce more sales because of the weather? We take weather volatility out of everything they do, which uh, saves money from less inventory, better sales forecasting, better replenishment, mm-hmm. marketing, et cetera. And uh, whose idea was this business? It was my idea. How young were you when you started this business? About 26, 27. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, how many brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, four other siblings. Where are you in the pecking order? Uh, I'm in the middle. What, what did being in the middle of it all, being in the middle of five, what did that do to you? How did that affect you? Well, middle means you have to bring everybody together, the older, the younger. So, so how's that playing out in terms of you building this business? Well, I think it's helped me to uh, work through the ups and downs of starting a company and to bring people together and to drive them to do their best and to make me better. So you you like you see yourself as the assimilator of people and ideas. You just like people and ideas coming to you, and then you keep figuring out how it all fits together because you're innovating this, this whole new world of weather and business and sales and revenue and stuff. We are innovating constantly. Uh huh. All right, Jeffrey. What do you get? What do you got, uh, Fred? Tell our national listening audience. I'd like to ask. I'd like to ask you about your dad. You and I both grew up with your dad. Uh, you from a much earlier age. But tell us about your dad and some of his accomplishments. Well, my father and my mother, because I have to mention her too, were both pretty uh, amazing uh, people. Uh, my dad uh, he was a builder. A, a, uh, a developer uh, in the Philly area. Yeah, was he successful? Uh, very su- su- successful. Your father was uh, known as one of the most successful developers in this region. Yes, good. Keep going. Uh, and uh, he's uh, done a lot of projects. Went from building houses after he got out of the service to. Uh, Wasn't he also buildings. a chairman of one of the famous universities in this area? Also, he's been on the board of Temple since I think '68. He yeah, is chairman and, of the and, board. Uh, and uh, he's he was involved with a lot of nonprofits. For- also, your father's a pretty well-known, a pretty well-established entrepreneur and, and giver backer to society. Jeffrey, where were what, you with what that? Did, what did you learn, Fred? What did you learn from your father? Uh, I learned from my father that I could do anything that I set my mind to uh, as long as I worked hard and to really shoot for the stars. And, and that was important because I was a, a stutterer growing up, so I had a very hard time. Mm-hmm speaking and uh, he was always telling me to really look past the stuttering and not to let it bother me or to slow me down in terms mm-hmm. of work ethic you mean you're telling us about your work ethic and you uh, not not necessarily for your dad but you worked in hard con- you know in, in construction 
Uh, tell us about that experience. So my folks pushed us out of the door at an early age and always had us working. Always said to get a job, get out of the house, uh, and did a lot of different jobs growing up. Did uh, construction when I was a teenager and up through through a college. Uh, I continued to work in the field because it paid pretty good money. Fred, do you feel like your um, your work ethic came from external or internally with your family? Well, I think that my parents were always encouraging us to work. They were both Depression-era kids. Uh, the thought of not working and having their kids not work just, just wasn't in their uh, makeup. Right. What do you feel like you bring to work every day from your mom and then from your dad? Well, my dad uh, is a bit of a dreamer, and my mom is a lot more down to earth. So the the uh, combination of one saying shoot for the stars, and then my mother saying make sure you can make a living and pay all the bills. Fred, you mentioned that some of the older guys you worked with in construction taught you pride in your work. Why does that matter? What does it mean today? Well, I think it means that no matter what you do in life, no matter what you sell, uh, no matter what job you have, pride is critical and being happy in what you do. So I remember working, uh, laying asphalt and, and, and doing all types of construction, and uh, the guys around me who, who were much older took great pride in the work and, and uh, loved their work. So, so that made a big impression on me that no matter what you did, that was the key. Fred, what you do uh, 20 years ago would have been considered uh, visionary, but there's also a real stick to about you. So where does the combination of uh, having great vision and being a real you know, dogged, stick to kind of guy come from? Well, I think the fact that uh, I, I was a stutter and I guess still am a stutter and having to get through that, and yet I sell for a living, uh, you really have to sort of just... Um, focus on not really giving up at any stage. And so with what we do, which has had its ups and downs over the years, because we were inventing just not a new service, but a whole new industry, we really had to stick with it and uh, figure out how to generate enough cash and money that we could uh, make it through to what is now the cloud-based age of analytics, which, as you know, is a, we're a sort of coming into a, to our own now after a 20 years. Uh, all due to where the to where the new uh, technology is. Brian, were there any responsibilities that you took over as your older siblings moved out of the house? Well, uh, the first thing I did was I recall that my brother was taking his last box to put in the car to drive to college, and I was putting my first box in his room. So that was the first thing I took over. <laughs> Fred, it, it really does take some persistence to build a business out of something that nobody thought of before and stay with it as it develops. Tell us, where that where did that persistence come from? Well, first, I was young and, uh, and I didn't know enough to know that probably I maybe shouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, and I think the other thing, again, just getting back to my... Uh, father and his his encouragement to shoot for anything you want to do sort of gave me that sense that I could take risk and not only that I could but that I should be taking risks to try new things Fred, so you, what, oh. what would you share with the young folks listening to us today that were in your shoes that are in your shoes well I would say that when you're in your 20s even your uh, 30s that's the time you got to take the risks because as we all know as time goes on those those are times to take the risk become a much smaller window and so uh, those are times you want to try to do the job you can't think you can do those are times you want to start a company uh, that may have a high chance of failing because if you don't do it now then when are you going to do it Fred, and, and I would say f just to learn from that experience, too. Fred, you learned a lot of your experience through osmosis. You know, you were around a lot of businesses. But you, you told me a few years ago that you took a Dale Carnegie course. And, uh, and, and that was really for communication skills and communicating. Tell, what was the impact? Tell us about that and what was the impact. So uh, I actually won a scholarship in high school to take a course because I won a, I guess, a scholarship in a junior achievement by selling a, uh, a, a strobe light product that, that would fit into your car. Oh. Uh, and uh, it sold a lot, made a little bit of nice money off it, and they gave me a scholarship to Dale Carnegie. So I was about 
probably 16 and everyone else in in the course was in their 30s and 40s and that was a pretty wild experience you were 16 everybody else was in their 30s and 40s and God, tell me more about what happened and how you, how you felt and what you learned well, I, I, I felt it was an absolute fish out of water. Like, what the, what the heck was I doing here? Uh, to people that were had kids and jobs, and you know, and I had just started driving a car. Uh, and but I learned that in Dale Carnegie, again, you you know, Dale Carnegie, it's about a little bit about. Uh, uh, move, doing what you have never thought about doing and sort of achieving uh, greater than you have in the past. So here are these people in their 30s and their 40s who are out there really trying to change their lives. And it taught me uh, that there's no age too uh, old uh, that you can really try to make a change. It was a great experience. Didn't it frighten you that at 30 and 40 you were going to have to keep on making change? Well, the age of 16, you can't think that far ahead. Uh-huh. So you were just planting the seeds. Um, you, you're, you're your father? Pardon? Uh-huh. You're, uh, you're a husband, you're a father. How, how do you balance all your time? How do you spend your time nowadays building the successful business? Well, I, I have two uh, sons, one who is uh, uh, 25, one who's 19, mm-hmm. or, or, or 24, mm-hmm. and one is 19, and then I have a daughter who is six. So you have a lot of responsibilities. But what's the what's the website address of this organization known as Planalytics? Uh, Planalytics.com. It's P-L-A-N-A-L-Y-T-I-C-S. Yes. Planalytics.com. We've been with Fred Fox, CEO of Planalytics, here on Executive Leaders Radio. Back, you're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohn. We'd like to introduce Adam Stokar, who's the founder and president of Club OS. Adam, what's Club OS? Club OS is a software company helping fitness and wellness businesses reach their goals. How many uh, How many clients you got? 3,000 gyms with about 45 people. Uh-huh. Who started this business? Uh, I did. How old were you when you started this business? 22. Uh-huh. All right, Jeffrey? So, Adam, uh, how... Tell us about how young you were, maybe around age 10 to 12, uh, when you started organizing people around an idea. Sure. Um, Well, I'm the oldest of two brothers, uh, three brothers, and uh, the first time we had to all get together was when we were selling CDs. So it was my idea to sell our CD collection, and they helped uh, bring people off the street, make sure there was water, um, you know, kind of some of the support to uh, help sell CDs. First startup. Yes, technically, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Drew. Adam, you're in the health and wellness field. I'm just curious, were you an athlete growing up? Yeah, you could call me an athlete. I I played basketball uh, up through high school. And what position were you on the team? Uh, Point guard. And what what was your role as the point guard? Uh, Just making everybody uh, be in the right position and and helping them succeed. I really enjoyed passing and and getting other people set up to to make the shot. And, And do you see how that position relates over to business today? Absolutely, yeah. I like making other people the stars and just being there to support them. So you, your, your nature is to come up with ideas, to pull people around ideas, and to make them the stars. Exactly. That's interesting. Our experience here on Leaders Radio is those are the CEOs that are going to go the farthest because they're not tying themselves up. They're empowering their teams. Meg? How are you getting these people's buy-in? I mean, your brothers with the CDs and your basketball team, how are you getting their buy-in? Sure. I, I think just trying to figure out what people need and what drives them and then being able to control and deliver that to them is, has been a big factor. How do you feel like that relates today? Um, it's the same thing with employees and customers, you know, figuring out what drives them and what inspires them and aligning that with what the business needs. Mm-hmm. Who's got the next question? What about your childhood got you interested in being a software engineer? I've always been interested in building things. So Legos, Connects, uh, model airplanes. And what's that have to do with software? Uh, software is, is building. It's just building things with code versus physical objects. You're telling me that playing with Legos actually led you into it's the same kind of stuff you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, video games as well. Just a- anything that was you know, building or, or advancing um, 
mm-hmm. related. Adam, you mentioned in the green room that your mom used to always take the opposite side of an argument. How did that influence you? Yes, it, frustrating at times, but um, it did help me you know, take every situation from a different perspective. So even though I might think one way, I was able to put myself in the other person's shoes and think about how they might respond. Mm-hmm. Who's got the next question here? Adam, uh, you had moved uh, when you were young uh, to very different environments. Uh, uh, did that make you feel like almost like an immigrant in your own country? And how did that affect the way you've been able to sell nationally? Sure. My parents grew up in Long Island and I grew up in Pittsburgh. So the, the cultures were very different. Um, and, you know, being one of the few people uh, in that situation, it, it helped me relate to new cultures and new ideas and um you know, I didn't have any bias towards my own thoughts. Wait, 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 wait. Give, give me that again. I'm trying. I'm, I don't understand what you mean. What do you mean? Uh, just growing up in in a culture that kind of wasn't what it was. Not not the same as in our house. You know, outside of the house was very different, and we had to be able to adapt and learn um, to be you know to make friends and to make relationships. Well, how's that helped you build a business? Uh, it's a very diverse world and, and diverse country, and there's a lot of different people at Club OS that have come from different backgrounds, um, and it's helped us grow. How? Uh, you need different perspectives. If if everyone thinks the same, you, you know, your whole business is going to become one, you know, one note. And uh, I think we've done a good job of of keeping it diverse, and and the ideas and the growth have come from that. Huh? Don't you want to keep control of stuff though, and make sure things are going in the right direction? Uh, sometimes. I mean, I think you have to have some, some boundaries in certain ways, but I, I'm a very, uh, you know, I, I like a lot of new ideas and, and innovation. And I think as a software company, you have to embrace uh, different ideas and you can't just think you know it all. Oh, So I, I just want to get this straight. So being a Jewish kid from New York, going into rugged, tough Pittsburgh, right? Why were you accepted there? I mean, how, how did you make friends? Um, I think, again, you know, going back to my mom being someone that always was a devil's advocate and saying, well, what would the other person think? Um, I took that to school. I took that, um, you know, with my teachers and just tried to learn and, and not be a know-it-all, but more absorb what, what other people were teaching me. So how does that help you run your business every day? You kind of just have to know what you don't know and, and be open to other people coming in and helping you. And, and sometimes that's hard as a, as a founder or a CEO because you want to be in control and you want to you know, be the boss. But um, it's, it's uh, refreshing to let other people kind of drive the business with you. Were you a good student in school? I was. I was forced to be my, by my father. Um, you know, grades were a, a big deal to him, and, and education and getting good grades were always kind of the top priority growing up. So it was important foundation. for. What did your dad tell you about school? He said, you're going to school. Um, <laughs> so I didn't really have a choice. I guess uh, it's pretty simple. But he actually, he, ga- he gave me the list of, of colleges that I was going to apply to, and he kind of had a, he, he, was, he helped me, you know, he guided me on that, on that mm-hmm. direction because I didn't really know what college I wanted to go to or what I wanted to do in, in high school. So he really helped just put me in a place where, you know, it wasn't a lot of forcing and, and, and uh, saying I had to do this one Peter? certain job. Adam, this business you're in is a really new business, new idea. Is there any limit to the ideas that you could bring forth, and what would you do next? Um, I don't think there's a limit in terms of how many businesses we can help. You know, there's there's hundreds of thousands of gyms out there, and, and we're really behind the mission of helping people stay healthy and, and be happy and, and stress-free. So it's um, really bigger than than running a software company that does gym software. Absolutely, yeah. I, I always try to um, bridge the gap between software and the real world. Even though we are a software company, we're affecting real people in the real world, and we have to remember that. have to remember what? It's not all in the cloud. It's not all digital. You know, It's not all automation and, and doing things for you. We're still, we need to talk to people. We need to get out into the gyms and, and watch them work. And um, well, sometimes how, do you, you how do you know what the gyms need? Uh, we talk to them all the time. We talk to the, their customers. We talk to the owners. We talk to big franchise organizations. And well, I thought the way you, I thought what you did is you just you sold them, but you're telling me you ask them as opposed to selling them. 
Well, I mean, there is a little salesmanship, you know, going against competitors, but um, we we very thoroughly explain that we're not just a software company and we are a full service, you know, customer success company. So really the mission is much bigger. It's helping people be healthy. Yeah. Indirectly, you know, we're we're helping businesses that are helping people get healthy. So there's a there's a connection that we've really been getting behind. Um you know, to make sure people remember, we're jo- we're not just typing code and. and are, uh, you know, are your brothers involved in this business? Either your brothers. Uh, my middle brother was uh, uh-huh. involved. He, uh-huh. He's no longer there, uh-huh. but he uh, he did help uh-huh. us for about and, three years. Uh, is that that mom and dad still around? They are. Still have they around. been? Have they been to the office? Uh, they've been to the office. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you think they felt? Uh, I think they're they're really proud. Um, I think they pat themselves on a, on the back sometimes, um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, they're, they're proud. I think, again, my, my dad's a doctor. I think he probably would have preferred me to be a doctor, but seeing everything now, um, he's, he's very happy. Even though you're not a doctor. Yeah. You were supposed a to be a bit Jewish a doctor, but you ended up being a Jewish businessman as opposed to a Jewish doctor. But uh, my, my youngest brother's a doctor, so we right. got that. And, 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 and mom, does mom, what kind of credit does mom take for your development? Again, she's always been kind of the rock and, and the inspiration. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of external in- inspiration from the business side, so she she gave me the the drive to say like you can do it and you'll figure it out. And but I thought, you, but I thought you told me earlier that mom was the one that would always present the other side of the coin. Yeah, that, well, that that was the two sided uh, um, aspect of her motherhood is also you know questioning the decisions and making me think things through. Um, and thinking from other perspectives. Peter. Does so it, mom still challenge you? Absolutely, yeah. My, my brothers and I always say, you know, could you be on our side for one one of these discussions? <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, it's it's a healthy... You, you know, talk to your mom about business? I do. What kind of... What did your mom do for a living? She was a CPA, um, so accounting. Uh-huh. Does your mom hand this? Does your mom give you accounting advice? No, no, no. It's business I, uh, advice. Yeah, she she was worked for a very small business, so there's different uh-huh. levels of accounting. Um, but what's mom? So, but mom really is a pretty potent influence. It sounds like to you nowadays. Absolutely, yeah. If if I could pick one person that kind of was there and, and inspired me and helped me grow, it'd be her. Wow. What's the website address of this organization? clubos.com let me have that one more time clubos.com we've been speaking with Adam Stokar president founder and president of Club OS here on Executive Leaders Radio don't forget to visit our website executiveleadersradio.com to learn more about our executive leaders we'll be back in a moment right after this break your name and organization is Mike Massiello with Diversified Staffing Group. And what do you guys do? We solve. Um, we f- we find talent for our customers and find the right match. What kind of cus- what kind of cl- what kind of matches do you find for information your technology, accounting, and finance, and human resources? And earlier, you were telling us in a previous spotlight that you know you were recruiting friends to gather uh, empties, which you would then resell when you were six or seven years old. But you also were involved with the newspaper route. What happened with that newspaper route that was unique? Well, w- in town there were two big routes and I wanted to consolidate them both so I actually purchased the newspaper route from my competitor who was a 10 year old so you you have this ability to grow organically as well as to grow through acquisition and you're demonstrating this at the age of 10 11 12 I guess the common thread is always people and it's growth isn't it it's it's always been about identifying good people growing and growing um what's the website address of this organization dsgstaff.com let me have that one more time dsgstaff.com and your name again is mike massiello this has been your business spotlight back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Chris Chapman, founder and senior vice president engineering for Amino Payments. Chris, what is Amino Payments? Amino Payments brings together technologies from blockchain, ad tech, and payments to provide uh, transparency, integrity, and auditability to online advertising. Huh, interesting. And how old is this business? About a year and a half. So you're playing with a real, you're playing with real true vision, envisioning what the future is going to look like. Where are you from originally? Originally from Kentucky. How young were you when you were seeing around the corners in Kentucky? What was that all about? Uh, you know, a lot of my influence is uh, from my father and my mother. Um, he was a Baptist minister, and uh, I got to be there and see him uh, deal with congregations and groups of people that, you know, naturally 
uh, conflict occurs. Wait a second, wait a second. I'm asking you about seeing around corners and seeing markets and seeing visions, and you're talking about people? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, regardless of their specific purpose in the group, um, you know, people are people. Huh, interesting. Brian, what role did faith have in your childhood? Uh, it was a huge role. Um, you know, the when your father's the minister, the family is in the church. It's not just the father. Uh, and so dedication to the church, um, to things that come with that. Uh, mm-hmm. Jeffrey? To the people. So, Chris, you're in somewhat of a new abstract uh, emerging business. How young were you when you, uh, you know, had a new idea that maybe even started, you know, created your first startup? Uh, in uh, grade school, I would stop by a uh, little market and buy penny gum and then take it to school and sell it for two cents a piece. So, yeah, you understood how to make money as a young kid. All right. Peter, what do you got? So, Chris, the business you're in now, you have two other partners. Do you guys always agree? Uh, absolutely not. Well, you mentioned something in the green room about opportunities to compromise. What did you mean by that? Uh, you know, there's healthy disagreement, um, and there's a lot of value in taking in others' viewpoints uh, and finding a compromise based on everyone's strengths. Um, you know, but there are times also when you feel strongly about something and, you know, this you decide this is the way this needs to go. So you don't have a problem necessarily with people having different opinions. How do you get comfortable with that kind of conflict? Uh, you know, again, I think it does go back somewhat uh, to my parents. And also, I've been very fortunate in uh, my past job experience. Um, you know, you surround yourself with people smarter uh-huh. than you for a very good reason. Mm-hmm. And it's wise to listen to those people. True. Chris, you mentioned in the green room that your parents, um, mom and dad, worked tire- tirelessly um, for others, really even visiting folks on, you know, weekend in the hospitals and stuff. And I'm, I'm just curious what that kind of love um, how that impacted you as a youth? Uh, you know, I think it's very meaningful. Um, people are important in relationships, right? And uh, depending, you know, parents, siblings, um, people who have chosen to depend on you. Um, so wait a second, you were doing what with the church? You were going out and helping in the community? How were you doing that? Uh, I would help sometimes. Uh, doing you know, bring what? meals to the less fortunate. Um, how did that make you feel? Uh, very lucky, very blessed. What do you mean? I mean, wouldn't you? Didn't you want to be outside playing and stuff, and you're bringing meals to the needy? Uh, you know, I got to go outside and play as well. Um, but you know, it's uh, can, it should be very eye opening um, to see fellow human beings in that kind of uh, situation. Now it's interesting. You happen to be, you know, you're the VP of engineering, so you're dealing with technical folks, but yet you have this real people side. I guess that's one of the reasons you're really successful in terms of building an engineering team is because you understand people, let alone engineering. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, engineering is is a big part of it, um, but I don't think you can have one or the other. I think you need a skill set that spans both of those. Wow, wow, you're all about the people. Okay, Meg, what do you got? How do you use your, or how do you see your faith background playing a part in the people that you work alongside and your partners? Uh, you know, you uh, need to be selective in the business environment, but you choose people uh, to work with, and you have to have a certain amount of faith in those people that, you know, they're making decisions to the best of their ability and have the group's best interest at heart. Um, you know, you can't get by without. A certain amount of faith in other people to help you get things done. Wow. Next question. Chris, this feeling blessed and feeling lucky and willingness to compromise is is a very giving, positive attitude. Would you say that that came from your youth, and how does it convey into business? Uh, a lot of it came from my youth. Um, it, you know, you, you do have to take... Uh, take things from the other direction occasionally. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there will be times when, uh, you know, I appreciate everyone's opinion and it's been considered, I feel strongly we need to do this and this is what we're going to do. Um, so you need a bit of both. Uh-huh. Chris, I, I get the uh, the feeling that you're almost uncomfortable being too comfortable. So would you stir the pot sometimes just to you know, get uh, some comment out of people and get other perspectives? Uh, I try to do that. That can be a challenge for me. I'm a natural introvert. 
Um, but yes, I find that can be a natural role even for an introvert. Um, if you can start the conversation, you don't have to be the focus of the conversation necessarily. So, Chris, you mentioned earlier that your sister's an extrovert and that you're kind of an introvert, more quiet person. What really lights your fire about what you're doing these days? Uh, you know, learning new things, taking new opportunities. Um, being bored is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> how, about, how about having your own business? Uh, that's great. You know, it, it's, uh, again, you, you need to feel comfortable making difficult choices and um, you can't see around all the corners you've got to make best guesses Uh, and so it's fun to be the person that can do that Um, but it's also a little terrifying because you're taking everyone else in the business with you true so your, your dad was obviously um an inspiring role model to you growing up and i'm just curious you know when you're when you're faced with a tough decision at the office what do you hear your dad telling you uh, you know, to this day, I'll, I'll often call him and ask his opinion. And obviously, he doesn't uh, chime in on the engineering side of things. Um, but to some extent, people skills are people skills. And, you know, he'll help me evaluate, have I explored everyone's viewpoint and the options? And Your dad, the minister, is helping you build a blockchain technology company. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's helping us build... Uh, the people team that runs the blockchain technology. uh, Philip? Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, so you're not afraid to stir the pot, but as a minister, your father was a unifier. So do you find yourself stirring the pot and then bringing everybody together? Uh, Yeah, I mean, at the end, you you have to end up together. Uh, You know, things don't go well if you constantly divide the group, right? And so, you know, that's where surrounding yourself with the right people comes in. Chris, this sounds like opportunities to compromise. Again, a very positive attitude towards dis- dissent. Huh. Oppor- to opportunities to compromise. I'm going to write that down. That's an interesting concept. Where did that come from? Did you invent that or did somebody tell you that? Uh, I'm certain I heard it from someone else, but I don't remember where. Uh-huh. And, and you remember actually serving the community when you were a kid. Give us an example of that again. Uh, you know, there were times when uh, we would bring meals to families on Thanksgiving. Um, you know, when you would show up at the home and there'd be holes in the roof and literally the children didn't have shoes to wear. Um, again, it's very telling about how blessed you can be and not, you know, it's difficult to think of others in that situation sometimes. Uh huh. And you, and you continued to do that because you wanted to. Uh, sure. Yeah. You know, it's uh, again, it's it's expected of the minister's kid to do that, but you don't have to do that if you you know you can refuse to do that. But you um, did do it. Yeah. Why? Uh, it's important. I mean, what's I, important? I didn't get here by myself. A lot of people helped me, um, and I think. Everybody, whether they realize it or not, is in that same situation. People helped us, and that we should feel a certain responsibility to help others if we can. I don't, you know, you don't really hear that about business people, let alone, you know, startup entrepreneurs. And you're running this really successful startup, and it's fascinating hearing you talk about that. And uh, what's the best part of your day? Uh, Seeing my team productive and happy, seeing the business productive and happy, it's, uh, it's a great feeling. I thought you were to talk to me about writing a great line of code or something, but it figures you would go ahead and tell me it's about the people. What's the website address of this organization known as AminoPay? Uh, AminoPay.com. AminoPay.com. We've been speaking with Chris Chapman, founder and senior vice president of engineering, Amino Payments. Here on Executive Leaders Radio, Jeff, can you give us a rundown on who else we've had the opportunity of speaking with? Sure. Herb, what a great show. Marianne Frey, CEO of Maternity Care Coalition. Fred Fox, CEO of Planalytics. Adam Stokar, president and founder of Club OS. And then Chris Chapman, founder, senior vice president, engineering, Amino Payments. Excellent. I would like to thank my co-hosts, Jeff Mack, Newmark Knight Frank, Phil Haregi, Saber Systems, Brian Wallace, GoTo, Peter Snelling, Merrill Lynch, Andrew Hanlon, Hanlon Creative, and Meg Maloney, Addison Group, for giving me a hand structuring the questions. Hope you're providing our listening audience an educational and entertaining show. I'd like to thank our listening audience for listening. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a radio show. Let me grab uh, the website again for Chris. Your website address is? AminoPay.com. All right. Adam, your website address is? 
clubos.com. Clubos.com. Marianne, your website address is? MaternityCareCoalition.org. And Fred's website is Planalytics.com. Thank you for joining us today, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.